You're scared. I wonder, how do you hope to avenge Amon when darkness makes you tremble? A sphinx. I didn't realize they still existed. I don't know if I was the only one that was slightly disappointed that I didn't end up with a riddle. I guess her asking them about their own weaknesses is each person's personal riddle. You hope to save Taldori. You know of the dragons. Please, we're desperate. But you haven't the slightest idea what it will cost. I think that that's a really apt thing for when they're going out to adventure because we are all battling our own weaknesses. That's the thing that will drive us, that will sink us. And these weaknesses, similar to Vex and Vax, are often formed in our childhood. You may ask why, like why when you're going through a psychological assessment do they even care about your childhood because we're dealing with your problems now. But most of our wounds and weaknesses and triggers, the things that actually drive us are formed in our early childhood from like the ages of like 5 to 14 because that's when we're developing our sense of the world and our systems of trust. The twins. You depended entirely on your sister. You hopelessly seeking your father's love. Both unprepared. It's a really interesting dynamic because she's right and that's what affects Vex and Vax's attachment types. So for Vax, he depended on his sister because he saw her as strong and so she was kind of the rock that he held onto and that's why he has more of an anxious attachment style. He needs her desperately and when she's not there, he worries and needs to chase and find her. And for Vex, she ended up wanting her love from her father but her father was that absent father she never could really get enough affection from him. But because she couldn't get it, she ended up learning to depend on herself. She was like that baby that cries and the parent never really comes and soothes them. So they ended up learning that the only one that they can really depend on is themselves. And because of that, she has more of an avoidant attachment style, which means that when she's worried or upset, she kind of goes off on her own. And she doesn't really want to depend on anyone else because she assumes that in the end, everyone will leave her just like her father. So she ended up having this wound that his affection was the only thing that really mattered. And no matter how much affection you get from others, that wound isn't really healed. The way that we end up healing it is we end up having to be that secure attachment to ourselves, which is self-worth. We often seek this out for both Vex and Vax. They seek this out in others. It'll feel good for a period of time, but then it never really resolves because it's not about this other person. We've projected it onto someone else, but in the end, we need to heal it within ourselves. We need to be that secure attachment style, that good parent to us. What have we done? Show yourself! Why would I listen to the cursed heir who wallows in self-pity, begging to be trusted again? He doesn't trust himself either because he wasn't able to save his family, save his sister, and he ended up being blamed for it. And so because of that, he ended up kind of being this loner. And I think that she's right when she's talking about him wallowing within that, that he ended up kind of pushing everyone else away because he didn't feel like he wanted to get close to anyone else. Of that lack of his own trust, he feared that he could lose them or not be strong enough in order to protect them like what happened in his childhood. And so because of that, that's why he was this apt host to this demon, because this demon would give him what he really craved, the power, this power and strength in his vengeance. And by grasping this power in hopes of becoming strong enough, because that weakness, that insecurity of being helpless that we felt hurt so deeply that we want to hold on to anything so that we never have to feel that pain again. For Percy, it's much more complex because he actually has to give up control. He's so controlled because he wants that power. He wants to be able to stop bad things from happening. For him, he has to embrace the fact that control is an illusion. You can't actually stop bad things from happening to people, even if you try, even if you're powerful. And so what he would have to do is do the opposite. Trust others trust himself and know that he can just do his best and that has to be good enough. And that's a really scary thing to do. It's almost like taking a leap of faith. She's trying to get in our heads! Says the hopeless, holy warrior. You don't even have faith that you can save those dearest to you. I do think 
think she's wrong about Pike though. I think that Pike has shown the most growth over last season to today. She started off as this cleric that didn't believe in herself when she spoke even of her powers, of her rank, of her station. Now when she speaks, there's this gravitas in her voice. There's this strength that she commands things. And so I think that the Sphinx is trying to rattle her to see if she truly believes in what she's trying to stand for or not. I think that Pike is already on the way to be able to really embrace who she is. As she takes more of a leadership role and other people listen to her, I think that that's really helped her flourish. Because the more that you speak, the way that she stands, her voice, the way that she projects it, as you believe in yourself, others will as well. And so I think that she's already on that path and she should just keep on doing what she's doing already. Fleeing from your duties again, Keely. What do you fear more? Failing your Aramente, or knowing no one will live long enough to see you achieve it. Even when she was speaking to the Sphinx, there was no power, no strength in her voice. You could tell that her ability to deal with confrontation is still really weak. She doesn't yet believe in herself. She's worried when she speaks about it. And so I would say she's still this caretaker. She cares a lot about what other people think of her. And she's really worried about disappointing people and dealing with that confrontation. I think that that's Keyleth's greatest weakness and the one that she has to overcome. So for Keyleth, really what we would want is we would want her to practice being able to say things that she fears people may not agree with. And you start with people that you feel safe and trusting with and then you as you feel more comfortable you continue to be able to state things that may be more controversial or even saying no to something when you usually want to say yes that's how we deal with if you're overly a caretaker and you care too much what other people think you don't have to call out my shit, okay i know i can be kind of annoying no one cares about you i'm no different Oh, that one hurt. That's why poor Scanlan like shows off as being so narcissistic because that really is his fear. His fear of being forgotten because he's overlooked because he might be small or might not be this powerful. Stating that like, yeah, I don't even have one for you because I didn't even remember that you existed <laughs> was was probably more painful than, than anything else that could have been given. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt it. Like being insulted is one thing, but not mattering enough to even be insulted is the bigger insult out of both things. For Scanlan, that's a really hard thing. How do you heal when your ego feels broken that you have to always project that you're amazing because you fear that other people won't notice? It's really hard to deal with when you have really weak ego strength because you feel like if you're not always the center of attention or saying things that gather you attention, that people will forget about you. and. The problem is, is that if you're not as extreme or overt or loud, people actually will give you less attention. And so what you would want to do is really work on that inner dialogue. I don't have to always get so much attention to know that I'm loved and cared about. And so what we would want to do is really work on who he is, what are the traits that he brings, the quieter traits, the things that he appreciates about himself. And so going through those affirmations every day will help build up who he sees himself as and increase his internal global self-esteem instead of that external ephemeral self-esteem that is only good for when you're actually doing something, but then you're only as good as the last thing you've done instead of who you are as a person. Where does your strength come from? Trick questions. You want me to say my muscles or my rage, but I know it's my heart. I really like Grog's answer because that is his strength. His strength is his heart. He's this gruff, tough outer person, but on the inside, he's all soft and mushy and caring and loving. And so I do think that this is one of his better strengths. Wrong. I also love that it's wrong because everyone expected like, good job, Grog, you did it. And they're like, aha. Uh -huh. Would you sacrifice your life just to prove a point? I don't care if I die. None of us do. But we're not leaving. I like that Pike was able to stand up and speak, but I think that in a therapeutic sense, especially with them as a team, it would have been nice if we had that moment that each person was able to kind of recognize what was their own weakness and how they were gonna kind of work through it. That's true growth for each character as well as for ourselves. You have much to learn about being a warrior. You 
Um, show me the next one. I already have. <laughs> that was a great answer. That was a really great answer. For me, I believe that the true strength for Grog is believing in himself and trusting his instincts because that's what he has to do as a warrior. He doesn't have that time to think. He has to make these kind of split second reactions that have to be true to themselves. And for warriors, for fighters, even that flinch of a second can mean life or death. I also love that he doesn't hold a grudge. I love that. He's just so pure in that way. As someone who's battled dragons in dungeons, run in the shadows, hammered wars, and basically played RPGs all my life, today's sponsor, World Anvil, is so incredibly cool. Whether you're game mastering, game planning, writing, doing any kind of world building, World Anvil has you covered with 25 amazing article templates that you can use to create wiki-styled presentations, interactive maps, and chronicles with interactive timelines. So you can literally map out events across time and space. If you have paper all over like me and it's hard to read your own notes, World Anvil has you covered. You're playing D&D, World Anvil supports 5th edition and other systems. You can create your own world to bring your campaigns to life. Even if you're dealing with a drow archmage like me, this makes killing Strad easy as pie. One, two, I might be kind of exaggerating. <laughs> okay, there might be some things that even World Anvil can't help you with. Basically, you have all the best tools to help you write, organize, enjoy, and publish rich settings with complex characters. You get to write, world build, manage your stories from a single platform. And with World Anvil, world building is fun. You're not just making a module. It's a cornucopia of every RPG player's dreams. Have you ever lost a character? like I have, you don't have to worry with World Anvil because it has one website to rule them all and keep them safe. You can sign up completely free, but if you're watching this video, you can try out World Anvil for a limited time. You can get 40% off your annual membership using the code GeorgiaDow. Just click on the link in the description and use the code GeorgiaDow. Clicking on that link really does help out this channel and thank you World Anvil for sponsoring this video. These are my thoughts on some of the strengths and weaknesses of the characters of Vox Machina. You can let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And hopefully I'll see you in the next video.